Um, so what this is, is the uh, last year, the big thing in crypto was Gentry's fully homomorphic encryption scheme. And um, Gentry's scheme is based on these lattices, and um, it contains a fully homomorphic thing by a thing called bootstrapability. Um, and what we do in this talk is, um, it's a bit complicated, Gentry's scheme. And for mere mortals like ourselves, we try to simplify it. And so the way we simplified it was try to remove all the lattices so we didn't have to think about lattices because linear algebra is a bit hard for us. Okay, so we got rid of that. Um, so the so idea is try and make this more conceptually easy to understand. Um, it's more efficient and um, you don't have to understand lattices almost. So that's the, that's the vague idea. Okay, so what is a, a fully homomorphic encryption scheme? You've got five algorithms. You can generate keys. You can encrypt. You can decrypt. You can add some ciphertext together and you can multiply ciphertext together. Okay. Okay, so if we assume the message space is some sort of ring in that it makes sense to add and multiply uh, the messages, um, what we want um, from a fully homomorphic scheme is that if you, there's some operation that you can do on ciphertext that you call add, which kind of, when you apply it it's, and decrypt, you get the same thing as decrypting ciphertext and then adding them, okay? So once you've got this, you can evaluate the arithmetic circuit, any arithmetic circuit over a ring. So once you've got this, you can do anything, and you can do eight impossible things before breakfast, and we're all brilliant. Okay, so, that's, so that would be very good. Okay, so let's look at gentry scheme from 50,000 feet, and then we're going to get lower. Um, okay, so what gentry's got, he has a, um, a what's called a somewhat homomorphic scheme, which can evaluate circuits in a given set. So imagine this is, you can evaluate circuits down to some bounded depth, but you can't do any more, okay? What actually happens is every time you multiply uh, ciphertext together, um, each bit of ciphertext has got a bit of randomness attached to it, which we call dirt, and then when you multiply it together, they get more dirty, yeah? So the more, you, more operations you do, the more mucky the ciphertext become, and eventually they just become so mucky there's no message left in them. Okay, now what uh, Gentry's scheme has is that it's what's, it's got, it's what's called bootstrappable. Now that means that it's the circuits which it can evaluate contain its own decryption circuit. Okay, so if it contains its own decryption circuit plus a little bit more, which allows you to do something useful um, for large enough values of the security parameter, we'll come back to that, um, you, then you can bootstrap it and you, then you can do anything. Okay? Um, so, the, so to allow you to all fall asleep, which I think some of you have started to do already, but to really make sure you can do that, um, is the real problem with Gentry's construction and with ours from a practical perspective is the security parameter has to be astronomically large to enable bootstrapping ability to occur. And if you look at the appendix to the paper, that goes into it in more detail. So now you know you can't do it, you can all fall asleep, and I'll just witter on for the next 20 odd minutes. Okay. So we're going to go down to 10,000 feet. Okay, so what Gentry does, and this is where we're going to talk about ideals and then get rid of them, um, is that he has a large representation of an ideal J. So you take some ideal in some number field, which is essentially a lattice. The number field is not what the number field is. Everything's a lattice, okay? So um, this large representation of an ideal of, um, um, plus a small co-prime ideal. Think of the small co-prime ideal I as always being 2, because that's what it's going to be. And then you have the private key as a nice representation of the ideal. Okay, so if you know a bit about number fields, nice representation of ideals, are usually, if you take a principal ideal, is usually a generator, and a horrible representation is the Hermit normal form of the ideal. So you get that kind of idea. So to encrypt, you take a message in the ring modulo the ideal I. You add on some small random element um, from the ideal I. That's to kind of make it uh, uh, semantically secure, you know, to randomize the encryption. Uh, reduce it, modulo the big ideal J. Um, the stuff you add on, little i, has to be large enough to give semantic security, but small enough to enable decryption to work. So you have some sort of Goldilocks dilemma. It's not allowed to be too hot, it's not allowed to be too cold, too hard, too soft, whatever. Um, so it's got to be just right, and then everything works. And to decrypt, we use the nice representation of the ideal to decrypt. So for the rest of the talk, we're going to ignore lattices, because... Okay, so why is it, well, well, apart from this slide, and maybe the next one, but anyway. Um, so what we do is it's homomorphic because if you take a ciphertext which looks like, whoops, where did I go? If I take a ciphertext which looks like one of these things, n plus little i, 
And um, because of the fact that we're dealing with ideals, if you multiply something in an ideal by something else, you end up back in the ideal. So everything kind of cancels. And so adding two ciphertexts together gives you something that you just like an encryption. And multiplying two ciphertexts together gives you something that looks like an encryption. So everything looks like an encryption. So everything, so it's fully homomorphic. Well, no, so it's somewhat homomorphic. Okay? However, the muck has got muckier. Okay, so the muck is this bit of I we've added on. You can see when you multiply, it gets really horrible. So you've got this horrible expression. This horrible expression is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's where your problem is going to rely. Okay, so let's go down a bit further. So how do you represent ideals in number fields? Okay, so an ideal is a Z module, so we can represent it via basis. So an ideal is a lattice. Um, and elements in the ring we can represent as vectors or polynomials, if you like polynomials. Um, so the public key becomes a matrix, representing the basis of the ideal I, and, and the matrix BJ representing the big basis of the ideal J. And the secret key is a small matrix, not small in terms of dimension, but small in terms of the entries in it. Okay? So we're down to 1,000 feet. Okay, so if we look at Gentry's scheme again with, the, with these matrices, so we, we take some vector, okay, which is in, in, in the... In the ring modulo the ideal, we take some random stuff, multiply it by bi, and then reduce it modulo bj. And when you take a vector and you reduce it modulo a matrix, you essentially perform this operation here, where you take b inverse times the vector, and then you round all the coefficients to the nearest integer, and so on. Okay, so this is a standard, standard stuff in, in number theory, okay? So... It's kind of a weird way of doing stuff in number theory, but it is standard in number theory. Okay? So you, if you've seen Gentry's scheme before, and you've got to the bit before it gets really scary, that's how far you got. Okay. Okay, so we're going to get there and make it understandable to mortals, and make it implementable, by what we're going to do is we're going to perform four specializations. A number of these specializations are mentioned in Gentry's thesis, so we're not claiming at all that these are magically new or anything. We're just kind of combining them together and going, oh yeah, duh. Right. Um, so each one results in a computationally more efficient scheme. In addition, what we do is we actually get greater functionality than what Gentry can do. So Gentry's scheme actually uh, is the way it's described. Um, only allows you to do fully homomorphic encryption, assuming key sizes are astronomically large. Um, on bits, whereas we can do it on essentially arbitrary finite fields of characteristic 2. So you get something better if you could have arbitrary large key sizes. And we reduce the bandwidth as well a bit. So, okay. So, specialization one is we take the ideal J to be principal um, and having the basis SJ essentially being the principal generator. Because that's the kind of natural thing you would do if you were looking at this from a number, the number field point of view. So, algebraic number theory. So, we do that. So what that means is the matrix SJ, which was an n by n matrix, now gets replaced by a polynomial, i.e. a vector. So we've already reduced the key size a bit. Um, uh, Gentry suggests taking the ideal i to be the principal ideal generated by 2. That's a very good idea. We're going to do that as well. Okay. Specialization 3 is that generally in computer algebra systems, if you take a computer algebra system that can deal with number fields, uh, for example, Parry, uh, Kant, Magma, blah, blah, blah. Okay, you do not represent ideals normally by matrices. The, 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 most, the best way of representing the general ideal in a number field is by its, what's called its two-element representation. Okay, so if you take its two-element representation of, of the thing, um, the, the public basis uh, now just becomes two elements in the, in the, uh, in the, in the ring, um, so instead of having an n by n matrix, what you actually have is you have an integer, which is usually the norm of the ideal, and some monic polynomial. So this doesn't seem to gain much, since if m is equal to n, we retain the same, same thing as the, as the Gentry stuff, but um, we kind of... But, so if we choose this monic polynomial, which generates the ideal, so if we choose the ideal j special, okay, then so special that we can have n equals 1, then essentially the public basis of the big ideal J becomes two integers. 
Okay, a prime. So if we if we select it so that we get norm of this ideal j is a prime, we do that because it makes things much neater. But we can get rid of that um, with recent work we haven't yet uh, written up. Um, then the public key becomes the prime p and the polynomial x minus alpha. Okay. So this is the, this is the standard representation of a degree one prime ideal in the number field. Um, so now we could just write the entire scheme down using polynomial arithmetic and reduction modulo. So you go, well, how do, you know, how do, I, do, how do I do this? Yeah? I have to do reduction, which is inverting matrices and stuff like that. Well, reduction modulo, like, as I said, this is a very, it's not the way people in, in number theory thinks of reducing things, reducing the elements modulo ideals. So actually the reduction becomes very, very uh, clean if you have this representation. Okay, so we're going to have some, we're going to do everything in terms of polynomials, or you can think of vectors of coefficients. So we're going to have some balls, and because we're dealing with polynomials, we're going to mainly be using the infinity norm rather than the two norm. Okay, because the infinity norm seems to make more sense if you're dealing with polynomials. Okay, so we're going to define some balls, so there's the ball, uh, infinity ball arranged around the origin, which is of a polynomial of degree n minus 1, and the one with positive coefficients. Okay. So let's look at our scheme. This is key generation, and this is a dog's dinner. This is horrible, okay? So key generation is bad in the scheme. Okay, so what you do is uh, you take, take the plane text space. It's going to be binary polynomials. Okay, that's quite, quite standard. Um, now we're going to take a, a monic irreducible polynomial F. That's going to define our number field. And then we're going to repeat this loop. Now what's this loop doing? What this loop is doing is essentially coming up with G represents a element in the number field which has prime norm. So this is generating an ideal which has prime norm. Okay. Now what we want is we want, so because it's got prime norm, we know that there is a common root between G of X and F of X modulo P. So we now have to find this. So we find this root by taking this GCD modulo FP. And then we have to find the, the private key, which is essentially forming the inverse element. So if G represents an element in the number field defined by F, then uh, the polynomial Z, or actually Z over P, will represent the inverse element in the field. Okay, so this is just purely read Cohen, come up with an element in the number field, invert it. Uh, if it's, the element's got prime norm, find out the generate, uh, the two element representation of that prime norm. Standard algorithms will give you that key generation methodology. Okay, so that's ugly. You're not going to understand that, but that's where all the magic is. So that magic allows us to have a rather quite funky encryption decryption algorithm. So the encryption algorithm is really stupid. What you do is you take your message... You add on a random polynomial times 2, and then you evaluate that entire polynomial at alpha modulo p, and you output that integer. Okay? So to encrypt a message, you take a polynomial, which is your message, right? You add some stuff on, and you evaluate the polynomial to give you an integer. To decrypt, what you do is you just take your ciphertext, you multiply it by a magic polynomial B, and you take the result of divide by P, round to the nearest integer, subtract from C, take result mod 2, and you get the polynomial back you started with. So you take polynomial, you convert it to an integer, and then to decrypt, you convert your integer back to a polynomial. Okay? Which is kind of weird. Um, so that's, that's the, and the, and the reason that works is because of this magic here. But when looked at with the right glasses and when looked at when you make the right specializations, this is gentry scheme. Okay, so there's no difference in any meaningful sense. Okay, so to add ciphertext, what do you do? Just add the numbers. Multiply ciphertext, what do you do? Multiply the numbers. Okay, so that's, that's quite nice. Um, so good properties of this scheme um, is that decryption work, as we multiplied an integer by a polynomial, okay, the integer by the polynomial means that every component of the message polynomial that we get out at the end is independent in that operation. 
which means that we can apply the re-encryption mechanism of Gentry in parallel and therefore re-encrypt each bit individually, which would enable us to, uh, to do fully homomorphic encryption, if we had key size large enough, um, for arbitrary binary polynomials as opposed to just 0, 1 polynomials. Um, if you deal with arbitrary lattices, then the decryption procedure, which is the matrix times the vector, mixes up all the coefficients as you do the decryption procedure here. Whereas what we've got here is a, you know, very, it's essentially an independent every, the decryption on each, each component of the message space can be done in parallel. Therefore, we can do a re-encryption in parallel. So we get, we get much more functionality. Um, so this means, um, if we choose the F uh, properly, this means we can get fully homomorphic encryption over the field F2 to the N. By clever cho choice of F, we could get SIMD fully, fully homomorphic encryption if we had enough fields that we embedded together. So you can do many homomorphic en encryptions in parallel if you so wished, and the key sizes were big enough. Okay. Um, hence, you could do any subfield. Blah, blah, blah. You could do all sorts of stuff, right? So some parameters in, in the stuff which says that this, the scheme which I've got is only fully, uh, somewhat homomorphic, the same bootstrap procedure, so you can only cope with circuits of a certain depth. Bad properties is the depth's quite small. Okay? So as we work out in the paper to get a fully homomorphic scheme, you need a depth of around 7 or 8. Okay? That means you need to get, be able to do 256 multiplications after, one after each other. In practice, we can only get 1.7. A depth of 1.7, which is about three and a bit multiplications, okay? And even then, your prime P has 92,000 bits. So that's quite big. Um, but at least encryption and decryption is efficient. It just takes hours to compute the keys. But we're working on that, okay? Gentry scheme's got the, the same problem, but even more so, because encryption and decryption are just more complicated, okay? So, again, see the full paper for analysis of this problem. Security, this is what's really cool, because this answers a long-standing problem on the number theory list. The long, a long-standing problem on the email list and the number theory list is, can you come up with a cryptographically interesting encryption scheme, which is based on a, on a number theoretically interesting problem? Okay? So factoring is not considered a number theoretically interesting problem, neither is DLP. It's not proper number theory. Okay? So, so this, this answers this question. Um, so... Uh, you've got different uh, problems. Consider Elgamal. DDH is semantic security, but computational number theories don't care about DDH. CDH is message recovery. Computational number theories don't care about CDH. But DLP, they kind of consider that. Okay? So we feel it's not, not enough just to give a yet another hard problem on which to justify semantic security, because that's what we do in pairing-based crypto. Okay? Um, so what we're going to do is going to give some sort of well-studied problems to do with key recovery as well. Which, is, which are kind of, kind of cute and interesting, or at least to us. Okay, so semantic security is based on um, what we call the polynomial coset problem. This is just to um, upset all the people in complexity theory because PCP means something different there. Um, and so what it is, is, and also it's to do with uh, uh, oh, what Gentry calls, I can't remember, the something coset problem. Something, uh, the what one? Ideal coset problem, that's it, yes. So it, th th there is a bit of logic behind the name. So it's basically, uh, if you evaluate a polynomial at a, uh, at a point, um, can you distinguish it between that and a random point? So that's, that's semantic security, and the proof is, is trivial, that semantic security reduces to this problem. Um, blah, blah, blah. So that's, I mean, it says ideal coset problem. Okay, so you have to get the balls right to make sure it, it all works, but that, that's fine. Message recovery, that actually is the best known attack we've got on this scheme, but then again, we've only looked at it, is to apply lattices. So it, they are kind of related to lattices, um, and it's a pretty standard lattice problem. Um, so we have that. Okay, key recovery, this is the more interesting thing. Um, so key recovery is that if I give you the standard number, theoret number theoretic representation of a degree one prime ideal in a number field, can you come up with a small generator of that ideal? That's a proper number theory problem. And this is a proper cryptographic scheme-ish. Um, so they're, they're, kind of, so they're kind of nice and related, and, and it'll keep number theorists happy. So that's quite nice. And there's two methods to solve this problem. Um, method one, if there's a, a sub-exponential class group algorithm, uh, which, take, which you then apply to obtain a set of fundamental units and class groups, and then you have to smooth the ideal J over this factor base, and then you obtain generator. So this is so method one is essentially 
uh, the technology you use in factoring, okay, or fa yeah, kind of discrete logs and factoring that apply to class group calculations. And it's unclear whether the last step here could be done in sub-exponential time because the fundamental units are often impossible to write down, so you have to write them down in some funny representation, be able to write them down in polynomial time because they would take exponential time to write down for a general field. So there's all sorts of... This is kind of conjectural, but certainly it should be sub-exponential morally. Okay? Um, method two is that there's a, an odd method due to Bookman in his thesis, um, which is based on the baby step giant step method, but this, had, this method has exponential complexity in the norm of the ideal. So if I've got, it's a bit like discrete logs, if I've got baby step giant step methods, or you've got index calculus, okay? So, be an inter so it's an interesting number theoretic problem to determine whether key recovery can be done in uh, sub-exponential time. So if any number theorists in the audience, this will justify your research for the next few years. Okay, so in conclusion, we have a, a variant of Gentry scheme, which is essentially a specialization of Gentry scheme, has, small, has smaller ciphertext size, it has smaller key size, um, it can be made fully homomorphic over F2 to the end as opposed to F2. Key recovery is related to a well-studied problem in classical computational number theory. You know, well-studied 200 years of, you know, this goes back to Gauss, this, this problem, okay? This is, this is not some problem that cryptographers have come up with, you know, the ABCD pairing problem or whatever, yeah? It's kind of, it's a proper problem. Um, and it can be described without resorting to analysis, so hopefully this will aid some of you um, in work on future, on this scheme or other schemes, because everything is now understandable to mere mortals. But take a message, it's not a practical, fully homorphic scheme. I, th I think the question you want to ask is being a politician, is how much work would it be to make it fully? And essentially there's two problems. One is you have, so you can think of a Gentry's scheme as Gentry's re-encryption procedure, which is a mechanism to clean ciphertext. And when you multiply ciphertext, they become very dirty. Now, if, if, you can, if you can make the stuff get less mucky and get a better form of detergent, then you can kind of do it. And so there could be some breakthrough tomorrow, or not. <laughs> but it's, it's marginal. I mean, if you made the dirtiness go down by, by half the bit length and you had a small improvement in the cleaning, then it would be practical. So that's, you know, you know halving the bit length, that's not, you know, it doesn't sound too bad, does it? So, you know, it, it's plausible. It might be, for example, if you pick the, the polynomial F very carefully, like something very weird, that you actually do half the bit length of dirtiness, because it's set, that, that parameter actually comes from polynomial f. So it might be some very obscure choice of the polynomial f, which gives you exactly what you want there, which when you combine with, uh, uh, there's a bit of paper on ePrint in the last few days, which uh, simplifies asymptotically the cleaning process a bit, you know, and you combine those together with some other ideas, you know, it could be possible. But we don't know how to do that yet, practically. But in the paper, there's runtime. So this is, this is real, yeah? You can, you can evaluate. So this is a practical scheme that you can evaluate bigger circuits than BGN, say. So, and, and with our new scheme, you can do eight multiplications in a row, which is a depth of three, which is not in the paper. That's future work. Thank you.